Hello and welcome to worship with Cathcart's Trinity Church. Those final bits of, of music that, that Ian played there, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Afresh in Me, is in my head just as we begin this service of worship, is the Holy Spirit that comes to us and enables us to, to praise God. It's the Holy Spirit that binds us together in love, purpose and unity. So let's cling to the Spirit as we come and worship our God today. We're going to be thinking about one of the miracles of Jesus outlined in John's Gospel in chapter 2. And what John writes about the, the miracle um, is, is here in John chapter 2 verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. We're gathered today because we believe in Jesus. We want to bring him glory. So let's do that in song now as we sing to the King. salvation his empire shall bring joy to the nations when Jesus is king come let us sing a song a song declaring we belong to Jesus he's all we need Sing now with voices raised to Jesus, sing to the King. For His returning, we watch and we pray, we will be ready, the dawn of that We'll join in singing with all the redeemed Cause Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King Come let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus He's all we need Sing now with voices raised to Jesus, sing to the King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise, sing. With voices raised to Jesus, sing to the King. Let's unite our hearts and minds as we turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we do thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you that he came to this earth while we were still aliens far away from you while we were living in sin and rebellion and brought us into your glorious presence. We praise and thank you for the love that he set upon us, love that none of us deserve, but love that you freely lavish upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can lift his name on high. We can glory in him. And we can tell the world just how amazing a saviour we have. So Lord, we would ask that you would come and be at the heart of our worship of you today. That you would inhabit our praise. That the Holy Spirit would fire our hearts and inspire the thoughts that run through our minds. So that all 
would be an acceptable and holy offering in your sight. Lord, we thank you for the promise that we have been looking at through these last few services, thinking about the fact that you are making everything new. We thank you that you are transforming this world by your power, that you are at work within us, even now, helping us to become the people you call us to be. So Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes more and more to the new work that you are doing, that we would be able to worship and praise you for it, and we would also be able to engage with you in it, that we would be able to work alongside you. Lord God, we are astounded by that fact that you invite us to come and labour alongside you, to work hand in hand, foot beside one another, working for your plans and purposes, working so that your kingdom might come. So Lord, we ask that you would help us to do that. You would help us to fix our eyes on your kingdom, on what you have promised to do, and that we would seek that first and allow everything else to fall into place from that. We do thank you, Lord, that you have invited us to become part of your forever family, that you have called us to have a home in your eternal kingdom. And Lord, help us to fix our eyes on that, to fix our eyes on all that you have promised and to lay hold of it by faith. And as your family, we would want to take on our lips the family prayer, saying together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we turn to think about our church news, there are three items that I would like to share with you. Um, two of them are related to one another. So we'll begin with the, the notice that I shared last week, that over the course of Lent, we are running a couple of courses, and there are different ways for you to engage with them. First of all, there is the prayer course, part two, that deals with unanswered prayer. It seems to be a particularly apt topic during this pandemic, and um, there's going to be the opportunity to explore that on Thursday afternoons at two o'clock from the 25th of February. The other thing that we're doing is the Live Lent course, and as I was sharing last week, if you would like a booklet form of this course, it takes the form of daily devotions, please get in touch with me as soon as possible so that I would be able to, to get that to you. I'm delighted to say that the booklets have already arrived in Kithcart, so they're just ready to be distributed, so please get in touch. Those um, daily devotions, whether in app form or in booklet form, are going to be supplemented by discussions on Sunday evenings at 7 o'clock. Both these courses will take place on Zoom. The other thing that I'm delighted to share with you is that this coming Saturday, that's the 6th of February, we have a, a prayer meeting that takes place between 9 and 10 a.m. It takes place in Zoom, and if you're interested in coming along to that, please get in touch with me, and I'll link, link you up with um, Dougie Payton, who is in charge of the Zoom for that. That's all I want to share at the moment, and we continue on with our exploration of the New City Catechism. We've reached question five, which is a question that is rooted in question four that we were thinking about last week. Last week, we were thinking about why did God create human beings? And today, the question is, what else did God create? It's an important question because there are lots of religious groups out there that would say that different gods were in charge of creating different parts of the creation. But that stands um, against what um, the Christian belief would say. If we go to the answer uh, that's shared with us in the New City Catechism, we see that God created all things by his powerful word, and all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. What else did God create? Well, God created 
everything. How did he do it? Goes on to say, by his powerful word. And his creation was good, very good. We've been thinking about that over the course of the last few weeks, haven't we? The way that God created the world that was perfect. Sin entered in and messed everything up. But God is working towards something that is going to be excellent in the new creation. So let's declare these words together. What else did God create? God created all things by his powerful word. And all creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for this perfect world that you created. We're sorry that sin messed it up. Lord, our hearts long for the day when everything is going to be right and as it should be again. Where everything is going to be under your loving rule. Lord, we want to flourish. We want to grow. We ask that you would nurture us today. We pray this all in your precious name. Amen. Our next theme picks up the amazing hope that we have in God, the peace that he gives us here and now. Great hymn, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. Washed in his blood This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descend. Bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, I and my Savior. I'm happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long.
As I mentioned at the start of our service, our reading today is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 2, reading the first 11 verses. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through it. So we ask that you would help us to open our hearts and minds to you, that you would come to us clearly, and that we would be able to understand to believe, and to respond as you call us to. We pray this all in your precious name. Amen. So reading from verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding between 80 to 120 liters. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of his signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Amen. For my Christmas this year, I was given this puzzle. It's um, Professor Puzzle Presents Sherlock Holmes and the Case of the Priceless Coin. There are plenty of other puzzles available. The object of it is to put a coin in the front door and to get it out the back window. There's an internal maze basically going on inside it. And when I was reading the instructions for the, the puzzle, I thought I better do this properly. I'll read the instructions and see what it said. It said, there are three options for me in order to solve the puzzle. First of all, I could be a Sherlock Holmes and do it all unseen using touch and sound to make my way through the maze. Secondly, I could be a Dr. Watson and read instructions in, in a form of a narrative. There was a short story where basically hints were given as to what the maze might look like. And finally, if you were really stuck, you could be Mrs. Hudson, that's um, the housekeeper in the Sherlock Holmes story, who has a map um, to see around her own house, it turns out. After I'd said, um, right, I'm going to be a Sherlock Holmes, I'm going to try and solve it, well, I managed, but to be honest, there was quite a lot of just rattling it about in the hope that the coin might fall in a, a helpful place. Eventually, though, I decided, right, okay, I've solved it a few times using touch and sound. Let's see what the map looks like. And I looked at the map, and I sighed and smiled, I'll be honest, and said, oh, is it really that simple? The truth is, sometimes a picture allows us to get our head around something far easier than something else. In this case, it was certainly easier than doing the puzzle blindly. I think about times that I visited other countries and faced a menu that I don't understand or signs around me that I can't read. And I think to myself, well, it's great that there's a picture here that shows me the food I'm about to order or reminds me I really shouldn't be poking snakes or watching my step as I go downstairs. Here in John's Gospel, or rather throughout John's Gospel, John has provided a number of different pictures or signs to help show us who Jesus is. That's the object here in verses 1 to 11 of chapter 2. They're pictures so that we might believe in Jesus and through believing might have life. And in particular, they are meant to be signs that show us the new creation being worked out here in this world. 
pictures of it ahead of time, as it were, but rightly so, because Jesus was there. So that's why we see the sick healed or the dead coming back to life. And it starts here in chapter 2 with water being turned into wine. Wine, which is our topic for today. Throughout the Bible, new wine was a particular expression of God's blessing in the land. To give you one example, I'm going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 13. The Lord will love you and will bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your corn, new wine and oil the calves of your herd and the lambs of your flock in the land that he swore to give your ancestors. This verse is it's one of a, a number that I could have chosen. In fact, if you search the Bible for the word new, the word wine follows the word new more than anything else. It's actually quite a surprising thing as you, as you look through it. And that's why I felt I really did need to pick up this as a topic as we're thinking about God making everything new. But here we see a number of different things all bound together, which again reminds us of our approach here through the last couple of weeks and this week as we bound elements of the new creation together. In Deuteronomy 7.13, God talks about his people that he will bless, a land that he will bless, and a promise that he he gives to the people. He gives people a place and a promise of blessing and binds them all together. And that's actually what we've seen in the new creation too. People, a new you. A place, a new heaven and a new earth and a promise of blessing. That in one sense is the new wine that is hinted at right throughout the the Old Testament scriptures. But on another level is, is far, far more I actually really wrestled over this because I realized new wine is, on one level, a clumsy way of expressing the new blessings that God pours out. It's certainly something that could easily be misunderstood, but it is a shorthand in the Old Testament for an expression of God's fruitfulness as he sends his blessing upon the land, as he gives his people all that they need. You'll lose count almost. I certainly did. I gave up counting how many times it was mentioned there. But throughout the Old Testament, we discovered that this blessing of new wine, along with everything else that spoke of the land's fruitfulness through God, was lost through the people's disobedience. It was one of the things that the people were told, look, I am sent in a drought. You will have no new wine. So it also became something that was part of the promise of a coming Messiah. I'm going to read from Amos chapter 9. It's verse 13. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him who sows the seeds. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. That is to say, God is promising a day, a a day in the messianic age when the Messiah has come of blessing that is far beyond anything that the people experienced through their own lifetimes. And that's what's picked up here in John chapter 2. That picture of wine cascading down the mountains, sending a blessing. Okay, so what do we discover about the new blessings through this picture of the the new wine that Jesus brings um, about here in John's gospel. First of all, the new blessings are still to come fully. It's how it starts off here in verse 4. Woman, which is not a derogatory way of speaking to, to his mother in Greek, says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. In John's gospel, we actually realize that Jesus' hour that he is aiming towards is is the cross. But beyond that, Jesus also wants people to realize that whilst the kingdom of God is, is here with him, there's also an element that it will only ever be fully expressed at the end of the age, when he returns in glory. The new blessings are still to come about fully. 
Here and now in John's gospel, whether it's in chapter two with this miracle or the healing of the sick or raising Lazarus from the dead, we catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God in power, a prayer answered. But actually, there's still an element of not yet. The people Jesus healed, well, they, they got sick again in the future. Likewise, Lazarus at some point died. But the hope is for all of them that their healing, their raising from the dead, spoke of a greater healing and raising of the dead that Jesus was planning. There are new blessings still to come of life without end. And we wait for that. Second thing about the new wine or the new blessings that we discover here is that they are a gift from God. New blessings are a gift from God. When the wine has run out at this wedding, there is no one that could physically or from a human perspective sort this out. Jesus alone could cope and solve the problem of the lack of wine. God is at the heart of this. In fact, this is, this is a miracle that is meant to reveal that Jesus is God. And all the people need to do is listen to his voice, to do what he says, fill the water up to the brim. And that is their task in all of it. Do you see what um, Mary says to, the, to his servants? Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. It's a reminder that we are called to obedience because everything depends on what God has done. Likewise, we see that more broadly in the sense of the new creation. Jesus, yes, calls us to obedience, to follow him, to live for him. But all that we see, whether it's in Revelation or in Isaiah of this perfect kingdom, where there's going to be peace between people and the animals, where people will live forever and ever, well, well it's all done by God. It's God who comes, we're told, and wipes tears from people's eyes. Who is with his people. It is him who is given access to the tree of life. New blessings are a gift from God. Third thing we discover here about the, the blessings that God promises us in terms of the new ones for the new creation is that they are super abundant. The new blessings are in real abundance. Did you see how many liters of wine Jesus um, made? Say if we average um, the, the number, they've told that it's between 80 and 120 liters. So let's say there's 100 liters as an average in the, the six jars. Jesus made 600 liters of wine. That's not a little amount. In fact, I can't even picture 600 litres of anything. It's far more than this party needed. I don't know if you've ever organised a, a party and you've ended up with far more food than you thought that you would need. This is to the nth degree, so much bigger. But that's the picture of the blessings that we see throughout all of Scripture when God speaks about the new creation that God's blessings are over and above anything that we can, can comprehend. The best things in this world perish, spoil, or fade. But Jesus gives treasures that will never, ever fade. Going on, we see that the new blessings, the new wine is better than anything that has gone before. Again, here, the master of the banquet is the guy that's basically in charge of, of running the whole show. Is basically saying, wow, this is amazing. And says to the bridegroom, why, why have you kept this until now? It is a reminder to us that as Christians, yes, we have blessings now, but there is much more to come. That God is going to do something utterly and completely amazing. Something that is beyond anything that we can understand. And it's going to be amazing. And finally, we see here in that final verse, verse 11, that the new blessings are intended to bring about God's glory, to bring him praise. We'll flesh this more about next week as we think about the new song that God places on our lips, the new song that he, he has running through our hearts. 
But it's worth acknowledging even now that these blessings are, are meant to cause us to come and give thanks to God. It's been interesting over the, the last wee while. Um, at, at night time, I have, I have prayer time with the, the kids at home. And as we sit in and doing it, one of the things I always ask is, what do you want to say thank you to God for? And I'll be honest, over the last few months, there have been moments where we have had hard days or struggles or whatever else, but we've always stopped and been able to thank God for something. And it's interesting to acknowledge that. But that is what we were created for, isn't it? To, to worship God, to thank him and bring him glory, to praise his holy name, to thank him for the new blessings that he pours out to us. Blessings that are still to come, that are a gift from him, that are super abundant and better than anything that has gone before. But the question for us is then, so what? Well, on one level, there's that invitation to fix our eyes on what God is doing, on the eternity set before us, the treasures that cannot be taken away because God holds them safe for us as he holds us safe to lay hold of them. As I've already alluded to, there's that call to, to seek God's kingdom first, not our own plans and purposes, but to do his things and let everything else fall into place. There's the call to accept these gifts as they're given to us now. There are moments where the new creation pops into our lives in small ways as we hear God answer a prayer, as he speaks new life into a situation as people turn from darkness and rebellion into that place of, of belonging to God. It also invites us to accept the Holy Spirit. It's really interesting in Acts chapter 2 verse 13, when the people at uh, the time, who of the day of Pentecost, that saw the apostles running out and sharing the good news all in different languages, the people say they have had too much wine. Or that's what they say, at least, according to, to the NIV. Many other translations take the more literally from the Greek. And they've, they've written there, they are filled with new wine. I think they've got that right. Because when we discover new wine here in the Bible, it was never just about alcohol. Alcohol was a substance that God has created that we've got to confess here and now, sin is warped. There are people that use and abuse alcohol in a way that hurts them and hurts the world around them. It was meant to be a blessing, but at some point we lost sight of that. But here, as the, uh, as the people in Jerusalem said, they're filled with new wine. On one level, they were completely right. They weren't drunk but they had been filled with the new blessings that God pours out as part of his new creation, which includes the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is the new wine blessing for God's people here and now. And if we want to enjoy what God has on offer for us in eternity, that involves enjoying the Holy Spirit now, of inviting God again and again every moment of our lives to come in, to dwell within us and set his rule and reign, to turn us into a place of worship for God, a place that obeys God and follows him as he prepares us for that place where the blessings will never end and will never pass away. We will be thinking more about how that leads us on to praise next week. But here and now, it's right to respond in praise too. So let's sing thanking God for all the blessings he's poured out. Let's think about the Holy Spirit that now dwells within us. Let's sing come O fount of every blessing. of every blessing tune my heart to sing your grace 
Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Songs of God's abundant treasure Sung by angel tongues above Songs that tell the boundless measure Of my Lord's unchanging love I remember God's great mercy by his help I've safely come And I know he will not fail me But will surely bring me home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering far away from God And to rescue me from danger Shed for me his precious blood Through God's grace I am his debtor Daily I this thought renew Let that grace, Lord, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to you Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Take my heart, oh, take and seal it Seal it for your courts above And let us pray Lord God, that is our prayer, that you would take our hearts and that you would seal them for, for your courts above, that you would set our eyes upon you and all that you have promised, and that we would know that the treasures that are ahead of us in heaven are better than anything that this world can offer. Lord God, as we just mentioned it, I, I want to bring before you those that are struggling today with alcohol or with other substances. Lord, we ask that you would send a blessing upon them and that you would help them to be removed from this place of enslavement to addiction and instead would be found in your glorious light. Lord, we know that you are the one that can break the chains that hold us, that bind us to the sin and rebellion of dependence upon other gods apart from you. And we ask, Lord, that you would, you would come, you would save and rescue your people and would help them each and every day. Lord, forgive us for those times that we forget that our hope is in you. Forgive us for those times that we forget to thank you and worship you for all those myriad blessings that you have poured out upon us. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to live as people that have been blessed by you so that this world might be blessed and might be changed as we live a life of love as we follow you. Lord God, we ask that you would continue to be at work in the lives of, of those in our community who don't yet know you. Lord, our hearts break to think that they're missing out on a relationship with you and then also missing out on the eternal hope that you have given your people as, as an amazing gift. We ask that you would give us, your church, a clear vision of where you are calling us to serve of ways that we can reach out to our community, of ways that we can share your amazing love with them. We pray for, for gospel endeavours around our city, remembering all of the Christians and all the different ways that people are being supported at these times. We pray for, for ministers standing in front of, well, an empty room seeking to preach your word, Lord, we thank you that they are not alone, but that your Holy Spirit 
is there with them, binding them to their people, binding all of them to you. We pray for those who are writing to their congregations, those who are engaging with your word through the television or other manners. Lord, would you ensure that all of your flock are surrounded with love and given the support that they need at this time? Lord, we would pray too, asking that you would continue to be at work in the organisations that we contribute to or are part of as volunteers. We think of the well up in Govan Hill and ask, Lord, that you would continue to be at work through this ministry, that those that come into contact with it would be blessed and would be released from all the confusion with forms and whatever else, and secured in a place of blessing. We pray for the city mission, for the night shelter that is ongoing at this moment. We pray for the hotel that is being used and for the ministry that is going on there as people go out onto the street searching for those that have nowhere to sleep and also for the endeavours to ensure that after a few nights that people are homed somewhere safe and secure. We think again of the work for Hope for Glasgow and how they seek to enable people to be released from their addictions through strength found in you. Lord, we know that over the course of this pandemic, so many people have been turning to the wrong things to find hope. And Lord, we ask that you would help them to break free to find you instead. Lord, we pray on for people's mental health, asking that you would be at work in all of this, that you would protect people's hearts and minds with your peace and that you would give folk what they need. Help us to be there for one another. Help us to share your love and to be your blessing. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn today was picked for, for one of the last few phrases in it in regards to God preparing a table before us and just blessing us, pouring out oil on our head. We'll sing together, The Lord's My Shepherd. my shepherd I'll not want He makes me lie in pastures green He leads me by the still, still waters His goodness restores my soul And I will trust in you and I will trust in you alone For your endless mercy follows me Your goodness will lead me home He guides my ways in righteousness And he anoints my head with all and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his pure delights And I will trust in you alone And I will trust in you alone For your endless mercy your goodness will lead me home And though I walk the darkest path I will not fear the evil one For you are with me And your rod and staff Are the comfort I need to know and I will trust in you alone And 
and I will trust in you alone for your endless mercy follows me your goodness will lead me home go in peace to love and serve the Lord and may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>